The next time someone tells you to put away your cell phone because you're at risk for developing brain cancer, make sure they're not driving the car. Let's talk about something called tooth fairy science. Tooth fairy science is a phrase that was first used by a wonderful gentleman named Ray Hyman. It says, before we try to explain something, we should make sure it actually happens. It refers to doing research on a phenomenon before establishing that phenomenon actually exists. It's what we call looking for prior probability because extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. How many of you have gotten money when you lost a tooth? I see your hands out there. I'm curious how much you got. Did you get more money if your tooth was in a baggie or if it was wrapped in a Kleenex? Did you get more money if it was the first tooth or the last tooth? Does the money correlate with your parents' income? We can collect lots of data. We can analyze it over a long period of time. The results can be statistically significant. We're ticking all those boxes on what makes good science. But what's the problem? What have you learned? Well, I hate to break it to some of you, but there's no such thing as a tooth fairy. So even though all this research can be done, that's statistically significant. It's being done on something that is not possible. And that's the problem with a lot of these alternative practices. There's no prior probability. Homeopathy is one of the biggest uses of tooth fairy science that I can think of. And I'll be interested to hear what you have to say about homeopathy. When encountering a new or questionable claim, before you accept it, ask who disagrees and why. We have to get outside our bubble. There's too much misinformation out there and we have to critically evaluate these claims before we make a mistake that could have a devastating impact on our health. Jenny McCarthy's post hoc ergo propter hoc error. This is the one that kind of, she's the mother of the anti-vaccine movement after Andrew Wakefield. She said, after my son had his vaccine, he developed autism. Therefore, vaccine caused autism. Dr. Hall refers to this as a typical rooster error. She didn't try to find out what others said. She only looked for people who agreed with her. She didn't find out who disagreed or why. And she began the anti-vax movement in the US. Her pediatrician, Dr. Jay Gordon, believes that vaccines cause autism and he spreads false information. This is what, this is one of his quotes. I base everything I do on having spent the past 30 years in pediatric practice watching tens of thousands of children get vaccines, not get vaccines, and the differences I see. Jay Gordon is the pediatrician of the stars. Do you think his patient base is a little bit biased and that what he's seeing is a little bit biased? Well, speaking of biases, here's one of mine. I like what Dr. Mark Chrislips says. Chrislips caution, in my experience, are the three most dangerous words in medicine. Do you want your treatment to be based on experience or scientific research? Experience can guide your philosophy, but is it a way to practice medicine? Experience is very compelling. I saw it with my own eyes. The problem is experience is often misleading. We misperceive, we misinterpret, we don't remember things correctly. Our brain Another quote from a great scientist, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. All right, now we're gonna talk about some alternative practices. Again, for your final, you'll be asked to look at Dr. Hall's videos, one or two of them, and also videos by practitioners. Some of the information that you're going to hear from me is going to come from her information. And as I said earlier, I don't have any problem with you hearing it twice. Reiki is one of the two most common forms of energy healing. The other one is called therapeutic touch. It was, well, discovered in 1822 by Dr. Mikao Usui in Japan. 
Practitioners of Reiki claim to be able to channel energy from a universal source and direct that energy from the universal source into the recipient to heal them. It may or may not involve touching. I'd like you to now stop and watch the first three minutes of this video. It's on Blackboard. Emily Rosa has managed to maintain a very private life. She's the youngest to person to have ever published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. She's now probably in her 30s, and I can't find anything on social media about her. Please have a look. The first three minutes will be what I'd like you to know for class, but of course you can watch the whole thing. Then there's homeopathy, which was founded in the late 1700s by Samuel Hahnemann, who wrote his first paper on it in 1796. Homeopathy is rooted in mysticism and alchemy. He looks at disease as a matter of disruption of the vital force, a mystical invisible force that controls our health. Now you have to understand what medicine was like around the 1800s when he began practicing. There was no germ theory, there were no vaccines, basically it was Medicine was based on something called the four humor theory, and I'm not talking about it being funny. The four humor theory was based on a balance of hot, dry, wet, and cold. If you were sick, it meant there was an imbalance in these humors, and these humors could be balanced by bloodletting, purgatives and emetics, and mercury. In many cases, not being treated was better than going to the doctor at this time. The two basic principles of homeopathy are the law of similars and the law of infinitesimals. The law of similars means like cures like. In other words, a remedy will cure a disease in a sick person if it causes the same symptoms in a healthy person. You got that? The law of infinitesimals means the smaller the dose, the larger the effect. So kind of the less sugar you put in your coffee, the sweeter it tastes. I'd like you to stop and look at this video on how homeopathic remedies are made and then come back and tell me about what you think about how homeopathic remedies are made. Typical homeopathic dilutions are multiples of 100. We have 6C, meaning there's one molecule of the mother tincture in 10 to the 12th molecules of water or alcohol or I don't know. A typical dilution is 30C. In order for there to be one atom of the active ingredient in a 30C dilution, you would need to have a pill that's the size of the earth. Here's a homeopathic remedy for cough, a wet cough or a dry cough. Please note it says, this claim is based on traditional homeopathic references and not modern scientific evidence. Please keep that in mind when you make decisions on what kind of treatment you want when you're sick. Here's a homeopathic remedy for fatigue and exhaustion. If we keep in mind the law of similars and the law of dilution, if coffee keeps you awake, dilute coffee should treat insomnia. The more dilute, the stronger the effect. If you dilute out all of the coffee molecules, the water will remember them and the effect will be even stronger. The memory will persist even after the water is dripped onto a sugar pill and allowed to evaporate. And each dilution must be shaken, not stirred. That's the succussing that was talked about in the video. Now we'll look at acupuncture, another popular alternative practice. Acupuncture is the placement of needles to block pain and to bring about healing. Acupuncture believes that there are pathways in the body that facilitate the flow of energy called chi. A disharmonious flow of this chi causes physiological and psychological ailments. Acupuncture is based on the concepts of yin and yang, which are the two opposite forces of the chi energy. If the yin and yang are out of balance, ill health results, and they have to be brought back into balance through various techniques. On the left, we're looking at an ear. There's now something called ear acupuncture because someone looked at an ear and imagined that they saw a fetus in the ear. That led to the development of ear acupuncture where different parts of the ear 
correspond to points in the human body in the, and that's where needles may be placed. The thing is, when someone says they're going for acupuncture, I have to wonder what they mean. There are a lot of different types of acupuncture. There's the kind with skin penetration and there's the kind without skin penetration. So a lot of things count as acupuncture. Here's a list of things that acupuncture claims to work for. You don't have to read it. What I want you to look at is that these are the two, maybe two and a half, for which there may be some evidence, pain and post-operative nausea and vomiting. What I hear a lot about acupuncture is it's been around for thousands of years. This is referred to as the appeal to antiquity which basically says, historically, X has been used or it's a tradition. Therefore, X must be correct because it's the way things have always been done. The thing about this appeal to antiquity, well, bloodletting was around for a long time. Binding women's feet was around for a long time. And astrology is still around. Dr. Hall talks about this in her video. <laughs> Maybe acupuncture isn't so ancient. In 90 BC, there's literature that refers to bloodletting and lancing of abscesses with large needles made from stone and bone. I've always wondered how long these thin needles have been around. Early diagrams show the use of blood vessels, not meridians. Before the 19th century, needles were inserted in points of pain, and the term meridian wasn't really used until the early 1930s. Ear acupuncture came around in the 19th so maybe acupuncture isn't so old. Acupuncture research shows that it doesn't matter where you put the needles. It doesn't matter whether you use needles or pretend to use needles, what are, called, what are called sham acupuncture needles. All that matters is whether the patient believes in acupuncture and believes he got the real thing. This is where the relationship with the provider is so important. A sham acupuncture needle, sorry for the missing letters in this diagram, the acupuncture needle goes into the skin. The placebo basically retracts. This is how you use a placebo needle. A lot of times what I hear from folks who use these alternative practices is what's the harm? Even if it is a placebo effect, how is that hurting me? I feel better. I want to show you the results of a study. It was funded by the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, one of the branches of the National Institutes of Health, and the results were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is a high-impact peer-reviewed journal. In this study, they write, we compared the effects of a bronchodilator, two placebo interventions, and no intervention on the outcomes in patients with asthma. In a double-blind crossover pilot study, we randomly assigned 46 patients with asthma to the active treatment with an albuterol inhaler, a placebo in inhaler, sham acupuncture. Remember, these are the folks at the National Institute of Complementary and Alternative Medicine acknowledging that sham acupuncture is as effective as what they refer to as real acupuncture or no intervention. They measured an objective outcome, the maximum forced expiratory volume, the FEV1, for those of you with asthma, you can recall, do any of you recall breathing into that thing where you breathe out, breathe out, breathe out, breathe out until you can barely breathe? I know about it because I also have asthma and that's called your FEV1 and they also measured a subjective, how the patients felt after treatment. So what's the harm? If we look at subjective improvement after each of the four interventions, it looks like everybody but the no intervention control felt improvement. The albuterol group felt better, the placebo inhaler group felt better, and the sham acupuncture group felt better. This is statistically significant. Now let's look at the objective outcome. What's the difference, folks? In the objective results, only the active treatment, only the albuterol showed any results. The folks on placebo, sham acupuncture, or no intervention objectively had no improvement after their treatment. Let me show you that again. Subjective, objective. Subjective, 
objective. I have to tell you folks, this study really scares me. A person may be experiencing an asthma episode. They don't want to take medication for it. They'll have an acupuncture treatment and think they're feeling better while their lungs and their bronchioles are becoming constricted because they don't have the proper medication to improve their health. That's the harm. The conclusions of the study, although albuterol, but not the two placebo interventions improved FEV1 in these patients with asthma, albuterol provided no incremental relief with respect to self-reported outcomes. Quote, placebo effects can be clinically meaningful and rival the effects of active medication in patients with asthma, end quote. I have to tell you, I am holding on to my head as I'm reading this out loud because they're making it sound like the subjective outcomes are just as important as the objective outcome. But they do include, from a clinical management and research design perspective, patient self-reports can be unreliable. Please, if you have asthma and you are having an asthma episode, take your medication.